Good morning. How is everybody? Bright, sunny day here. We are great. And with uh, John Gilstrap and Matt Harvey in studio here. So we're all uh, eager to ask you a few questions here, if you don't mind. Sure. uh, I'm ready. First and foremost, so this morning I wake up, I'm driving in, and I hear this national security brief uh, on the radio in Washington, D.C. about uh, the Russians potentially launching some type of new uh, secret weapon that could uh, nuke America's satellites out of the sky, and it's created uh, quite a stir among the press. Uh, apparently someone broke confidence and mentioned that when they weren't supposed to. Uh, what do you know about this, and any details that you can fill in? Well, honestly, uh, I don't know much more than what I see in the public sphere. I did get uh, some communications with uh, Senator Rubio, who's the ranking member on intelligence, yesterday saying that they've been monitoring this situation, which tells me that it Whatever the specific uh, situation is, has existed for a while. Uh, That's troubling, and certainly anything considering uh, the two words there, Russia or nuclear, are uh, uh, amazing alarm alarm bells in everybody's mind. Um, You know, I I assume as we move through the day, we will probably have a briefing by phone, but we can't go secret over the phone. So we we do have the opportunity to read the materials in Washington uh, if if we need to be, but uh, it sounds like I guess it was Senator or uh, Congressman Turner from Ohio, who's chair of Intel over there, really raised the alarm bells here. Wants the administration to be more forthcoming, and I think that probably, in light of the leaks and whatever else has come out, would be in the best interest of everybody that the administration would be more forthcoming. Perhaps it's just because news is so much easier to hear and gather instantly now, but it appears that there is a collaboration amongst America's enemies as of late to join together. And is that my perception or is that a reality? No, that is a, that is such a, uh, a stark reality. I mean, I think we're, we're facing global threats like we haven't seen in decades. And if you look at Russia, uh, you know, Putin, you look at the Ayatollah, in Iran, you look at Xi in China, uh, you see the uh, disruption and the terrorism with Hamas. Th- these are all things that stirring together want to see a weak United States. And, and that, I think, is, is, sounds alarm bells to me, because that's where we need to step up and be strong. And uh, I think that uh, they're waiting for us to falter one place or the other. You can see them, you know, they're bombing our commercial ships in uh in the Red Sea, they're bombing our bases. Uh, attack, Iran through their proxies bombing our bases, and we lost three of our servicemen and women. Uh, this is a time, I think, of, of great uh, great peril for us. But we are the superpower, and we need to assert ourselves. That's my belief. John Gilstrap. Good morning, Senator. Um, I want to hey. talk a little bit about the the border bill. Senator Manchin was on the on the uh, show yesterday, and expressing uh, disdain. Uh, He's upset <laughs> that the border bill didn't pass. My question to you is a simple one, I think. Do we need congressional action to close the border? Is that really something that has to be done through Congress? Because it seems to me that President Biden was able to undo, a, open up the border on his own. Can he also close it on his own? Or is that something that really needs to have congressional action? President Biden, no question can uh, close the border down, can, through executive order, uh, initiate uh, policies that will uh, lead to fewer and fewer and fewer uh, illegals coming across. President Trump did this very, very effectively with his Remain in Mexico policy, his quick turnaround on deportations, building the wall, etc. So th- this president has the tools to do that. But you know, in December, we had 302,000 people came across the border. In, in January, 197,000. These are astronomical numbers. And uh, the president has shown no willingness to try to, and he wants to lay it off to Congress, when in reality, he has the tools. Uh, there are some tools in the immigration package that, uh, that would have really helped, uh, for instance, the asylum rules and the parole rules, so that the president cannot use parole to just parole Two million people into the country, which is what he's doing in his catch and release program. So the president can solve this problem a lot, but he just has no willingness to do it because he prefers the open border. So then from a political perspective, pure raw Mm -hmm. politics, why would it make any sense for the Republicans to give him shelter on this when he can, in fact, do it all on his own? 
Well, I think that was the crux of the argument that it came down to when when we were considering Senator Lankford's uh, uh, negotiated settlement with the Democrats on on immigration reform. I, I think it went too far. There were a lot of questions about it. There's the whole thing about you're letting 5,000 people in a day. Why would we be doing that? You know, th- there's some logic behind the decisions that Senator Lankford made. But in reality, if the president doesn't enforce the laws he has now, why would he be enforcing a new law? He would just ignore it. And I think that's what a lot of uh, why a lot of people like me said, uh, we want to keep moving forward with border security, but this is not the plan to do it. And I don't see I don't see for the life of me why the president doesn't see the political pressure here that the, the border is bringing in, to bear on him and his chances of reelection. That alone should be a reason he should be looking at this uh, much more um, in a much more forceful manner. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Senator Capito. So hey, Matt. Along those lines, with the uh, with the House voting to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, um, mm-hmm. what are your what is your stance on that and your thoughts? Well, that will be coming over to the Senate as soon as we return after the president's uh, President Day um, break. You know, impeachment's a very serious charge, but Secretary Mayorkas has fallen so short in terms of uh, his abilities to enforce the laws. Um, I think that, you know, we'll, I'll certainly look at the evidence, but um, as far as I can see, um, Secretary Mayorkas, he owns some of this as well. And, uh, and so I think that's why you see him subject to impeachment. I mean, personally, I don't think impeachment should be coming up every two or three months or every two or three years. I think the founders of our Constitution designed it to be a rarely used instrument, but in this case, it may be the right one. And so I'm going to look and see what happens when it comes to the Senate. That will be uh, uh, in the next week or so. Uh, but I do believe S- Secretary Mayorkas has uh, shown himself to be very deficient in his position. Well, isn't his authority derived through the president? And if he's just following orders, then are you impeaching the wrong person? Well, I think that's the question is not so much are we impeaching the right person, but is he simply following orders of the president? But if he's ignoring uh, congressional intent, which I think he has, uh, I think that's a whole nother. uh, And that would be more uh, looked at to be a more impeachable offense. I see. When I ask you a question about the recent uh, governor's debate in West Virginia in which your name Uh was invoked, and uh, I believe it was Chris Miller who jumped in and addressed Attorney General Patrick Morrissey and said, this is West Virginia. We don't talk about people's mamas here. Uh, Just from a distance, your thought, obviously Moore's campaign is Moore's campaign, but it's unusual for your name to come up in a governor's debate. Yeah, I think it's very unusual for another candidate to mention somebody's mother, but I will say this, um, whatever the conversation that the Attorney General was talking about, that I supposedly weighed in on a drug settlement. It's absolutely false. I never had a conversation with him about that at all. So I don't know where he's getting this. And uh, I wish that he would uh, uh, just, uh, you know, he, he calls me when he wants something, but not, uh, not when he wants my opinion because it's not my job to tell the attorney general how to settle a case. So that is a false story there, and I wish he would correct that. I want to ask you also about government funding and some deadlines that are coming up in regards to the shutting down of the government. I know we've talked to you about this in the past. It seems like oh, we've talked to you about this every this other like year. Deja vu. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know obviously you're not a fan of shutting down government, but uh, there yeah. are some serious financial issues this country needs to address, and they need to address them quickly. We definitely need to address that. If we, if we keep doing what's called a continuing resolution rather than pass the new bills that uh, we are, and me as a, a member of the Appropriations Committee and others are writing, we're actually going to spend more money. The bills that are in front of us right now that we should be passing spends less money. That's what we're trying to do. And so I hope that as we move forward uh, the next several weeks that uh, Senator Schumer puts these bills up onto the Senate floor Speaker Johnson has done this already, and that we, uh, we we move towards a compromise. I mean, we're we're compromising now, or we're we're uh, negotiating with our House partners right now on the bill that I do, which is Health and Human Serv- Health, uh, Education and Labor, uh, enormous bill. So, uh, and it spends less money than it did last year. That's what we want. 
So I don't know why. I think the Democrats just can't spend enough money. And so that's why they keep prolonging this into the continuing resolution uh, period that we see. But we will not shut down. I don't think anybody wants us to do that. And um, and so hopefully we'll have some resolution here in the next several weeks. John Gilstrap. Is it fair, really, to lay that entirely at the feet of the Democrats for wanting to spend money? I mean, both parties have been in power and both parties have spent a lot of money. A recent bipartisan bill just committed another tenth of a trillion dollars to Ukraine and Israel. Uh, so it, I, is that fair to lay that at the feet of the Democrats? Well, I think in the case I was talking about, it is fair in terms of the appropriations bills for this year. I take your point, and I think you're making a good point, uh, that overspending is, is, is a shared mutual uh, um, fault. Uh, and that, uh, But I think we as Republicans, me as a Republican, are more willing to face this uh, than what I see from the Democrat leadership and the president. Matt Harvey. I, I heard that you were going to be in the Eastern Panhandle soon. I am. I am. I'm going to be there. I'm on my way there right now, as a matter of fact. And uh, I'm going to just, as I always do, uh, tour around Chris Strobel, my, my man in, in, the, in the Panhandle, is going to take me around. I'm speaking at Rotary at lunch, and then I'm going to, go to the garage market. Uh, I'm going to go see the day report center, and then I'm going to have some conversations with our orchardists about some issues that they've been having with uh, not being able to sell their products. I want to understand that issue a little bit more. So it's basically just a a brush up for me on uh, life in the panhandle, and I always look forward to it. It looks like a good day for it, too. Yeah, a couple days ago, you would have had a real problem getting here. but. (laughs) It's cleared up. It, it was. It came fast, up. but it left quick too. It really yeah, left quick too. That's the, that's the deal. The, Good, Matt. Y- y- the day report center. Um, is there any for day report centers in general? Is there is there federal funds available? Yes, we're going to be meeting the um, um, Haida, the new Haida director, uh, Tom Carr, who was you probably know him. The longtime uh, director um, has moved on, and so uh, I think he retired. We're going to be meeting the new uh, new guy out there. His name is Jeff Beeson. And while we talk to Tim, who's the director of the Day Report Center, there's a lot of DOJ money involved with this. And um, and also uh, SAMHSA, which is under health uh, for behavioral health clinics. So, yeah, it's good for me to see this because I'm actually the, as I said, the appropriator in this area. Uh, and uh, it will. I've already been out there once, but they've do, they're doing an expansion, as you know. Right. And so I wanted to take a look. I want to go back to what John mentioned a moment ago, which was funding for the Ukraine and for Israel. I uh, heard mm-hmm. a report uh, two days ago on my drive in out of Washington, D.C., in regards to Putin next setting his sights on Estonia and coming up with imaginary reasons to invade Estonia. Uh, and that's a border country around Russia, also right. part of the former Soviet bloc, which Putin has expressly stated was a great tragedy. The greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union in his mind. Uh, Ukraine is is uh, another piece of the puzzle, and then Estonia. And then the report also said, and this has to do with the greater strategy of within two to three years attacking a NATO nation, which I would assume is Poland, since that's kind of like the next one you know, downstream. Is this something that's getting any news in your uh, in your Senate right now, Senator Capito? Absolutely. I mean, we voted, to, and I voted in favor, and I'm catching some flack on this. But, you're, Rob, you're, you're putting it exactly uh, as we know it to be. Putin is telling the uh, ruling or, or the uh, prime minister in uh, Estonia, who I've met, that uh, because she took down uh, uh, Russian statues uh, that from uh, commemorating Russians from past times, uh, she did that, and other countries have done it because of the invasion into into Ukraine. That she's now, if she if she enters Russian space, she's going to be arrested and incarcerated, and all of these kinds of things. And so uh, it tells me that the argument that's made that if Putin is successful in Ukraine, he goes right to Estonia or Poland. It's a NATO country. We have we have agreements with NATO countries that we will fight alongside our men and women. And I want to do everything I can to keep our men and women out of the fray. And that's why I think part of the reason of supporting Ukraine to keep pushing Putin back 
is uh, is an important aspect of this. And uh, it could be a smaller country like uh, like Estonia. And and then you just you, you see him. His goal is to reconstitute the USSR uh, that fell in 1991. He's very open about that. And uh, we have to do everything we can to preserve freedom in that area of the world. Mr. Harvey, you had a question. Yes, Senator. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about the recent decision by Biden that really has a devastating impact on other parts of our state, and that's his LNG decision. Mm-hmm. What in the world is the LNG decision? I mean, are you there? I am. Yeah, I, I guess pr- probably for the, the listeners, they need to know right. what LNG is, first of no. all. Yeah, I, I know what it is. I, it's, it's a liquefied natural gas. Um, and my phone went kind of weird. I thought maybe I'd gotten caught off. Uh, it's the liquefied natural gas terminal permit permits that are in the in the Gulf of Mexico. So so we're telling our allies and our um, uh, our uh, natural gas producers that you're no longer going to be able to liquefy the natural gas and send it uh, to Europe or Asia or wherever it will go. And uh, these are massive ports, massive employers, but it has impacts in West Virginia because it impacts. We're some of the largest gas-producing area in, in, the, in the world, just here in the uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia region. So it will have impacts on this. And I, for the life of me, we, energy independent is something we talk about all the time. We have the resources. Why is this administration disallowing uh, us to be able to use our own resources for ourselves, but also to help our allies, who we said will help you get off of Russian natural gas. And if you ask anyone in those countries, what do you do when the United States no longer sends our liquefied, our LNG to you, what are you going to do? And they say, we have to turn to Russia. Is that a position we want to see our friends in? No. So I, I don't know why the administration, I think he's doing this to answer his uh, uh, in young environmentalists who want to see him be more extreme in his environmental uh, positions. And so I think it was a totally political decision and very, very misguided. Senator, just in this in this 20 minutes or so that we've been on the air, we've gone through some really important issues, scary things that are, that are happening uh, worldwide mm-hmm. and certainly scary things that are happening within the country. Is there a way and, and, and the Forgive me, the political theater is how I see it of of the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas only because not not that he doesn't deserve it, but we all know how it's going to end. You know, it's all going to there's going to be a vote that's more or less along political lines. Isn't isn't that kind of a waste of of time? Shouldn't we be working on other things? You know, I I think you're uh, here again. I think I think it's more the point, and I think I tried to make that point earlier in that the frustration over the border is just at a boiling point. Uh, I I mean, literally, when I'm doing my usual stuff, the grocery store or filling up the car with gas or whatever I'm doing, that's the first question out of anybody's mouth in West Virginia. What are you going to do about the border? What We're we're being overrun. It's not fair. I I met a lady yesterday or the day before who said, you know, she she immigrated and now she has family she wants to bring over. and They have all their papers, but they can't come. And that's the fair and legal way to to immigrate into this country. And those avenues are being blocked because of the glut of uh, illegals coming. I mean, just the visions of them when you see it on TV. So I think I think Mayorkas is being used as the sort of the poster boy of uh, or poster man of that uh, of that initiative. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's I mean, chances are it, it ever passes a Senate or slim to none. So I think it will be dispensed with probably quickly, but I still think it's something we need to hear. Is there a chance that we return to the days of comedy again in the near future? You know, that's a that's a really good question. I, I've actually been thinking about this a lot because, I mean, you all know me well enough to know that I'm not, you know, I'm not a bomb thrower. I don't, you know, re- lash out on Twitter or anything like that. Try to respect people who have differing opinions and uh, try to formulate relationships with people that I don't necessarily agree with because I think that's how you get you get things done. But it's just to the point, if you're not with me 100%, then you're never with me. And I think that's a dangerous position to, to ask for your political um, support to, to come in that way. I hope we get back to the time where um, we look at what's good for the country is good for everybody. And, it, and it's maybe a different way to get there on different sides of the aisle. And, and we can do that. We did that in infrastructure, I think. 
and we're seeing the fruits of that. So I think we can get there, but I share your frustration. And when I read things, I, I just think, man, I, I spent a lot of time raising kids, telling them not to treat people like that. And now it's, it's okay. And, and, and that I, that I reject that I reject. Senator Shelley Moore Capito has been our guest. I'll, I'll send you out with a fairly easy question concerning the national debt. <laughs> that's a, that's oh, a that'll joke. be the yeah. simple one there. Uh, even if we are able to reduce deficit spending, until we get a balanced budget, we are still adding to the debt, which is 34 plus trillion, whatever the latest number is as we go mm-hmm. by here. Uh, so what are we doing to not just reduce deficit spending, but to actually come to a balanced budget, which we actually had about 25 years ago? Well, I think part of the issues are overspending, but a large part of the issue, as you know, is the growth. And here I, I, I are one, as they would say, the Bamer Boomer generation of Social Security recipients that are you know, and and our younger generation is not enough in the workforce. There's not enough in the workforce to to fill the coffers, so to speak. So between Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, that that's the main driver of this deficit that we're seeing that we see all the time. And so um, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. And there's decisions that are tough, but aren't aren't you know, not going to hurt anybody because you hear everybody, and I'm included. I'm not going to cut your Social Security and Medicare is safe with me, and that's a good position. But we have to look at how it's going to be handled in future generations, I think. And so that's the hard questions because I think that goes towards uh, balancing the budget alone is not going to solve the problem. We have to make some policy changes here. And uh, pretty soon when the trust funds go bank, you know, up belly up, which is in the next decade, these, these are going to the, the, the answers don't get any easier. Since we're not producing enough of our own young people, wouldn't part of that equation involve immigration reform to allow people to legally come to this country and begin getting mm-hmm. legal jobs where they're paying Social Security taxes and therefore paying into the system? Well, there's a thought that that is uh, would be one way to. Uh, generate not just the work, because we see worker shortages everywhere, but also to generate the taxes. I mean, but if you look at what, what was done at, at the state, the state, you know, tightened their belt. Of course, the state has to have a balanced budget, so that's a big difference there. But the state tightened their – and they were able to c- then cut taxes, which then keep the economy, you know, moving and uh, is more attractive to economic developers. So I think the federal government needs to – as I said, in our appropriations bill, tighten our belt and then uh, look at some of these long term um, systemic issues that are driving uh, the larger drivers in the deficit, make some tweaks here or there and then, um, you know, grow the economy so that we can a growing economy can help us get out of this, because I think that's what happened in the 90s. Yeah, I told you it'd be an easy one to end the show, Senator. That is so easy. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Hey, we appreciate your time this morning so very much, and I uh, wish you uh, right. a great trip to the Eastern Panhandle. 